After a century of myths and counter-myths, of deification and demonizing, it is hard to realize that behind all the portraits and caricatures to be seen on printed pages and on banners, there really was a flesh-and-blood human being named Karl Marx. He was born in the little German town of Trier in the Rhineland in 1818, in a three-story townhouse in a fashionable part of town. A baron lived nearby, and his four-year-old daughter was destined to become Karl Marx's wife. The people who signed as witnesses on Karl Marx's birth certificate were prominent citizens. The Marxes, like their neighbors and friends, had servants, property, education, and local prominence. Unlike most of their neighbors and friends, however, both Heinrich Marx and his wife Henrietta were descended from a long line of rabbis. Indeed, the town's chief rabbi was his brother, but they were brothers estranged from each other, since Heinrich Marx had abandoned the faith of his fathers. Karl Marx was baptized a Lutheran, and throughout his life he spoke of Jews in the third person, and seldom complimentarily. Marx was the third child born in his family, the second to survive, and the oldest boy. Younger brothers and sisters were born annually for the next four years, and then two more at two-year intervals. The father was a prosperous lawyer, who also owned vineyards, as well as houses whose rents supplemented his income. He was a man of wide culture and political liberalism. His son idolized him, and in later years spoke of him often to his own children, though they had never seen him, his death having occurred decades before. Marx's mother was Dutch and spoke German with a heavy Dutch accent. She was a devoted housewife, not a woman of learning, and though her son loved her in childhood, they were soon estranged in his early adulthood. When she died, many years later, Marx expressed not the slightest sorrow. Karl Marx grew up a brilliant, spoiled child who bullied his younger sisters and taunted his schoolmates with sarcastic witticisms, in addition to entertaining both with imaginative stories. He had a swarthy complexion that in later years earned him the nickname The Moor, a name used far more often in his inner circle, including his children, than was his real name. His neighbor, Baron von Westphalen, took a great interest in Marx as a youth and the learned baron would often take long walks with him discussing Homer, Shakespeare, Voltaire, or other great writers in any of a number of languages that the baron spoke. As a young man, Karl Marx attended the University of Bonn for one year. There he was an enthusiastic student, but also an enthusiastic drinker, and took part in rowdiness and at least one duel. His father transferred him to the University of Berlin, a larger and more serious institution. But the self-indulgent bohemian and spendthrift habits that Marx had exhibited at Bonn continued at Berlin, where he was sued several times for non-payment of debts. His father's letters show growing recriminations directed not only at his son's prodigious capacity to waste money, a talent he never lost throughout his life, but also at a more disturbing personal characteristic, egomania. One of Marx's many poems of this period says, Then I will wander godlike and victorious through the ruins of the world, and, giving my words an active force, I will feel equal to the Creator. The themes of destruction, corruption, and savagery run through Marx's poems of this era, two of which were published in a small literary magazine of the time under the title Savage Songs. There was nothing political about these writings. Marx had not yet turned his attention in that direction. He was simply, as one biographer said, a man with the peculiar faculty for relishing disaster. A contemporary description of Marx as a student depicts the same demonic personality, again not yet in a political context. But who advances here, full of impetuosity? It is a dark form from Trier, an unleashed monster. With self-assured step he hammers the ground with his heels, and raises his arms in all fury to heaven, as though he wished to seize the celestial vault and lower it to earth. In rage he continually deals with his redoubtable fist, as if a thousand devils were gripping his hair. In short, Marx's angry apocalyptic visions existed before he discovered capitalism as the focus of such visions. 
Marx entered the University of Berlin a few years after the death of its most famous professor, G. W. F. Hegel, whose posthumous influence was even greater than during his lifetime. Marx began to associate with a group called the Young Hegelians, who were preoccupied with philosophy in general and religion in particular, or rather with atheism, for they were radical critics of Christianity. Marx's formal studies languished. He took only two courses in his last three years at the University of Berlin. Marx became a bohemian student who merely regarded the university as his camping ground, and he was largely self-taught. The death of his father in 1838 and his long engagement to Jenny von Westphalen eventually made it necessary that he prepare to bring his studies to a close. Although he had studied at the University of Berlin, he applied for a doctorate at the University of Jena, an easier institution, noted as a diploma mill. His doctoral dissertation was on two ancient materialist philosophers, Democritus and Epicurus.